All right. Hello. Thank you for being here. Today is meant to be an overview of the materials and processes portion. Well, that's the name of the whole book, but in particular, uh, the materials and process portion of the level three ASNT basic. Uh, the basic was something that I struggled with the most when trying to get my level threes through ASNT, mainly because I didn't have an engineering background. And as many of you probably won't have a traditional engineering education, this can be the most intimidating part of the test because it contains a lot of information that you just don't ever become exposed to in, uh, in your normal career as far as doing NDT and uh, certainly not in our traditional education because you have to be specifically trying to learn about metallurgy and um, I mean, stuff goes down to the crystalline structure, which is something I never even heard about until I started reading in this book. So uh, if you're listening in your car or you're watching on YouTube, this is intended to be a supplementary guide to the material that AS&T uh, sells on their website. Uh, so here we go. We're going to begin reading through the materials and processes book, and we're going to end with working through some of the questions that are found in the level three basic study guide. Mine has been heavily, heavily used. Got pages coming all out. Um, I had this thing for longer than I care to admit before I actually ended up passing the test. So, you know, I may have taken the basic more than, uh, more than anybody. So I think that helps to qualify me as a uh, viable teacher. But at any rate, Let's go ahead and get into it. We're going to start with chapter two, the classification, structure, and solidification of materials. I'm going to be doing a lot of skipping around as not everything is, uh, some of the things are more background and less uh, technical, but I do think that this is a portion of the test that once everything sets in, you won't miss any of these questions because they're not really the kind of thing once you understand the definitions of what's being asked and you understand the basic concepts, you'll be able to solve uh, for whatever answer. But of course, we're gonna go through questions and answers and memorizing those is a surefire way to get a passing grade or passing grade at least. 2.1, classification of materials. Human progress is closely related to the ability to utilize existing and develop new materials for use in different products. Early civilizations have been named by the predominant material adapted for tools and weapons in that period, such as Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. Today, we are utilizing a wide variety of materials and combinations of them. We are producing sophisticated objects from miniature elements and electronic circuits to huge complicated systems, such as airplanes and satellites, consisting of millions of different components. Regardless of how complicated products may appear, everything around us, including ourselves, is made from combinations of a hundred or so stable elements. In this chapter, we will briefly review these elements, the way they are bonded, and their influence on properties of the final product. We are going to limit ourselves to engineering materials, that is, materials used to produce devices, structures, and machines in contrast to materials in biology, food, agriculture, and so on. So that actually is one of the test questions generally. They will ask you, how do you define engineering materials, and it is going to be uh, the materials used to produce devices, structures, and machines. Uh, that may not be exactly the answer, but that's going to be uh, one of the questions for sure. Four main categories. Although there are a number of ways to classify materials, engineering materials are often divided into four groups, metals, ceramics, semiconductors, and polymers. And of course, there are chapters for each one of them. Metals seems to be the uh, largest portion of the test, probably because uh, the people who wrote the test have most experience working with metals. Composites is big on there as well, but it's very important that you understand polymers as they do play a role in composites as well. The, uh, the difference between thermosetting plastics and thermoplastics, which we will all get into in additional videos. There are also several categories of materials that represent combinations of the above mentioned groups. 
either in a special form or for use in specific applications. For example, composites are made of two or more materials of the above mentioned groups. Carbon fiber is produced by carbonizing a polymer. Concrete is, com is a composite of multiple different ceramics. Foams are special forms of basic materials and intelligent materials are alloys of different metals that have special properties. In this chapter, we will briefly describe the general properties of each group and subgroup of materials. Properties and performance of engineering materials depend mainly on four factors. Very important to understand these four factors. One, types of atoms as well as atomic and crystalline structure. Two, fabrication, processing, and thermal treatment of the product. Three, surface treatment. Four, environment where the product is used. Okay, so these are incredibly important to NDT, even if we don't think so. Uh, we don't normally think of them rather. So number one, types of atoms as well as atomic and crystalline structure. That's kind of what we're gonna be talking about mostly in this particular video. The reason why the types of atoms and the atomic and crystalline structure is very important is because that's gonna determine whether or not a material is conductive, right? So if you're looking for something that's conductive, first things first, you're gonna be determining what kind of things can you do? What kind of methods can actually be used on the material? So um, conductive materials are good with mag particle, obviously, non-conductive, useless for mag particle. Uh, too conductive and you have issues, or too permeable rather, and you have issues with eddy current, you know? Um, so, you know, th those are just a few of the things that you consider uh, when, when trying to pick an NDT method. And that's what you're trying to be a level three for, to be able to look at a new product and figure out what is the best way to inspect this product. Or can it be inspected at all? Two, so fabrication, processing, and thermal treatment of the products. That's another huge consideration as well, because as we'll talk about later, there are things you can do to a material to lose its ability to be magnetized. Um, for instance, uh, austenitization does that to a material. So it's very important to know the thermal treatment or heat treatment of a product. Um, we'll talk about recrystallization and what that does to the uh, crystalline structure within the metal and you know fabrication. So is it a rock product or was it a cast product? Because that changes the internal properties. It's not always so crucial for us as NDT inspectors to understand all of those things. But as a level three, it's very crucial because, um, well, it's again, it's going to affect what kinds of inspection, what parts of it you can be inspecting. And uh, grain boundaries can make a huge difference when you're doing, you know, very sensitive ultrasonic examinations. They can make, yeah, you'll see it in phase three. Uh, service treatment, again, um, that's going to be a huge consideration. You can't I mean, you, you'll see a lot of times engineering specifications will call for a certain RA or RMS value, right? Because if you're trying to do a contact ultrasonic examination, you're going to need a different finish than you would say if you're doing mag particle, you know, dry mag, you might be able to get away with a rougher surface uh, than you would. Um, eddy current, another one, you know, it's going to be very difficult to minimize liftoff if you have an incredibly rough surface. Four, the environment where the product is used. Okay, that's another important thing because that's going to help tell the story of what kinds of defects you can come to, its, to expect. Um, if it is a cyclically loaded part or a statically loaded part, you know, static loaded, you might be looking for more um, deformation type defects and uh, creep, those kinds of things. Whereas something cyclically or dynamically loaded, you would be looking for more fatigue cracks. Um, these are the kinds of considerations that they want you to notice. We will discuss each of these factors in more details in subsequent chapters as well. In order to ensure the quality of the product, we have to inform, we have to perform inspections. The type and accuracy of the inspection Will greatly depend on knowledge, depend upon knowledge of the structure and behavior of the material being inspected. 
A comprehensive understanding of materials and processes requires several large volumes of specialized books. This book presents the prevailing concepts and an overall introduction to materials and processes in, in ways that would benefit the NDT practitioner. 2.2. General properties of engineering materials. Metals and metal alloys consist of one or more metallic elements, often with non-metallic elements in small amounts. Metallic elements are located in columns IA, IIA, IIB, and so on and so forth of the periodic table of elements, numbering used by chemical abstract services or service. With the exception of boron, which is considered to be a semiconductor, also, the rare earth series of active elements, or the rare earth series and active series, the lanthanides and actinides belong to the metallic group. The most abundant metals used in engineering applications are iron, nickel, copper, zinc, aluminum, magnesium, tungsten, titanium, tin, as well as gold in electronic applications. Many other metals are used in smaller amounts as alloying agents, like uh, molybdenum, for example, a steel might contain one or more of the elements, chromium, vanadium, manganese, tungsten, molybdenum, and others in addition to non-metals such as carbon, silicon, and boron. Metals can be used in their pure form. For example, aluminum and copper, but they are more likely to be alloyed with other metals and non-metals. The metals in alloys can be arranged in three ways. One, a specific atom in a metal is replaced by another from a, from a different element. For example, in brass, copper atoms are partially replaced with zinc atoms. Two, different atoms make a compound inside a metallic structure. For example, a number of such compounds can form if gold and aluminum come in contact with each other. These are known as intermetallic inter compounds. Three, some smaller atoms squeeze themselves between metallic atoms, such as carbon and iron. These are known as interstitial alloys. Basic properties. The nature of these alloys in terms of the atomic bonds that they form can strongly influence the speed of sound and the electrical conductivity of material. In addition, the Z number of elements used strongly affects the penetrating ability of ionizing radiation. Z number is the number of protons in the nucleus of atoms. It's the main differentiator between the element present. So you can add neutrons to the nucleus, but you can't add protons to a nucleus. So that's why the Z number, that's the, that's the number of, that's the number, of, for instance, uh, tungsten is, is 74 on the periodic table. What that means is there are 74 protons in the nucleus of tungsten. Okay. For that reason, it may be useful to understand the different classifications in which atoms might be arranged in an alloy. How bonding affects these measurable properties will be discussed more in detail later. Basic properties of metals are, metals tend to be good conductors of electricity and heat. They are often malleable. That is, they can be extensively deformed without fracturing at room temperature and at relatively high strain rates. They are relatively hard and strong at room temperature. Metals cannot be made transparent unless the metal is thinner than the wavelengths of visible light, for example, with physical vapor de deposition. Aluminum can be formed in thin enough layers to see through. Also, anything thinner than visible light is transparent. They can be made strong or tougher by thermal and chemical treatments, as well as machined, as, as well as mechanical strengthening methods. Some metals, such as iron, cobalt, and nickel, have desirable magnetic properties. Metals can be remelted and recycled. Malleability. Atoms and metal are arranged in a very orderly manner, as we will see later when we're talking about crystalline structure. But some of the electrons are not strongly bonded to any particular atom. Hence, when metals are connected to an electrical potential, such as the positive and negative terminals, terminals on a battery, they conduct current. Metals can be polished to high luster. 
atoms in metals can move away from their nearest neighbor by sliding and make bonds with other atoms. This is known as dislocation motion. And it is related to how metals can be extensively deformed without producing cracks and voids in the structure. For this reason, we can make different shapes out of metals without fracturing them. That property known as malleability is the reason that we can make large numbers of engineering products by forging, rolling, deep drawing, extruding, and other processes. Conductivity and other factors. Other reasons for using large quantities of metals in engineering include their electrical and thermal conductivities. Just keep scrolling down. Wide variety of mechanical properties and their abundance and the ease of cost of extracting them from ore, which can make them relatively low cost. Some metals, because they are rarer or more difficult to extract from ore, such as titanium, silver, and gold are expensive. So-called rare earth elements are not necessarily rare in quantity, just difficult to extract. Also, the emphasis on keeping waste and pollution down and preserving limited resources often favors the use of metals due to ease and low cost with which they can be recycled. In general, however, materials are selected based on desired properties such as strength, fatigue resistance, high temperature characteristics, wear, what wear properties, and electromagnetic properties. Okay, I believe we don't need to talk about abundance of metals, but we can skip to the properties of ceramics. Properties of ceramics. Ceramics keep their strength at high temperature, higher than most metals and polymers, and, keep, and they are resistant to most chemicals because of the strength and stability of their bonds. The properties of most ceramics can be summarized as, ceramics are electrical and thermal isolators. Ceramics are strong. Ceramics are very sensitive to notches, meaning small cracks can initiate fracture and result in catastrophic failure of the whole structure due to low toughness. This is something that we'll go over too when we get into the materials uh, or the properties of materials. Um, when, when we're talking about strength, it's very important to differentiate. Uh, well, the test is going to demand that you understand the difference between things like strength, toughness, malleability, um, ductility. Um, what are the other ones? Uh, elasticity, uh, that's just a few. And, and of course we'll get into all of them, but it's, it's, it's always very important that you know which feature or which property we're discussing uh, when you're looking at a material. Okay, ceramics are chemically stable. Some ceramics are used as soft or hard magnetic materials. There are exceptions to almost every one of these rules. Some complicated ceramics are not only electrical conductors, but superconductors. Some ceramics are super plastic. That is, they can be deformed to a large extent at high temperatures. Pure carbon in the form of diamonds is an interesting example of a ceramic that is a poor electrical conductor, but an excellent thermal conductor. Okay, so skipping ahead again, There's not really a lot about semiconductors on the test from what I remember. It is very interesting, but let's go ahead and talk about polymers versus monomers um, and all of the amazing things therein. Polymers, often called plastics, are substances composed of long chain repeating molecules. The name comes from the Greek word poly, which means many, and mers, which means parts. In most cases, the carbon element forms the backbone of the chain, and therefore, these materials are categorized as organic. Bonds between atoms in the chain are very strong. The bond between chains can be much weaker, forming thermoplastic polymers, or equally strong, forming thermosetting polymers. Individual products made from polymers are often called plastics, whereas non-finished products such as elastomers, rubbers, adhesives, coatings, and fibers for composites are called only polymers, not plastics. In this text, we will use the term plastics and polymers interchangeably for discrete products. 
while others will be referred to as polymers only. Origins. The word polymer was first used in 1866 to identify materials made from vegetable and animal products. The most common example of a raw material was cellulose. Uh, fun fact, you can use cellulose gum, which is, comes in powder form, to make coupling. It's a much cheaper way to make coupling than buying the ultrasonic sonogel and stuff like that. You just take um, cellulose gum, pour it in a bucket with water, spray it uh, with a water hose, and um, let it, let it kind of set up and it will turn into a very thick couplet. It's a lot cheaper than using the uh, products you get off the shelf. Cellulose, which was modified chemically into cellulose nitrate and used in photographic films, thermoplastic polymers. The first thermosetting polymer, phenyl formaldehyde, known as Bakelite, was developed in 1906. 1906. From that time until now, in a relatively short period of time compared with metals and ceramics that have been known for thousands of years, more than 15,000 types of polymers have been made commercially available. There are variants, there are variations of about 20 basic polymer families. Thermoplastics are used at least five times more than thermosetting polymers. Use of plastics, examples, of parts made from plastics are all around us. Milk and soft drink bottles, plastic cutlery, clothing, car tires, car bumpers, often plated to look like metals, toys, gears, parachutes, packaging, foam, furniture, epoxies, latex, paints, rubber balls, fluorocarbon resin coating on dishes, aramid for bulletproof vests, the list goes on. Although concrete, composite is produced most often by the production of plastics is produced most often the production of plastics is increasing continuously non-destructive testing of plastic test object is shown in figure 29 widely used plastics every day man widely used practice for e plastics for everyday products are called commodity plastics those used for engineering products are called engineering plastics Many plastics can be used for commodity as well as engineering products. For instance, polyethylene, which is produced in larger quantities than any other polymer, is used for plastic shopping bags and blow molded bottles. Com commodity plastics, as well as in underground piping and wear resistant machine parts, engineering plastics. Both groups of polymers, thermosetting and thermoplastics, can be used as a commodity and as engineering plastics. Properties of plastics. Just, wow, what a difference. If you're listening to this, I'm trying to adjust the screen size or the visual component. And I realized I didn't explain the difference between polymers and mol mo uh, monomers. And it's just uh, polymers are a chain of monomers. That's really all there is to it. Properties in plastics. Compared with metals and ceramics, polymers, plastics, have the following characteristics. They are much less stiff. That is, for the same load, they deflect and deform much more than metals or ceramics. For example, about 30 times more than steel. They are, at room temperature, many plastics creep or slowly deform with time which can cause undesirable deformation and lead to breaking. Thermosets are less strong than metals. However, they often have low density so that their strength divided by density, specific strength, remember that, specific strength is strength divided by density, might be close to that of metals. So one more time, thermosets are less strong than metals. However, they often have low density so that their specific strength might be close to that of metals. So that would make them um, really nice to use when you want something that is a low weight, but still gives you the same properties as you would get from something else. They are expandable when heated at a rate often 10 times higher than for metals. They are, they also soften and melt at much lower temperatures than most other engineering metals materials. They are flammable to different degrees. They are chemically inert and do not corrode but most of them disintegrate with repeated exposure to ultraviolet radiation. 
They are sunlight, ultraviolet radiation. Some polymers, for example, nylon, absorb water and swell. Most plastics are more affordable than other engineering materials. Most thermoplastic polymers are extremely ductile and malleable and can be easily formed into complex shapes. The same is true for ther thermosetting polymers before they are cured. That is probably the main reason that they are so often used in everyday life and are gaining competitive edge in engineering applications. Bioplastics are biodegradable and other thermoplastics, such as fluorocarbon resins, have advantages have advantageous wear properties. Polymers exhibit a wide range of properties due to variations in bonding, chemical elements, added fillers, and modification techniques. We will briefly discuss different types of polymers and modification techniques in a later chapter. Here, we will only describe the most common properties of thermosetting and thermoplastic polymers and compare them with properties of metals and ceramics. All right, and so now we'll get into the difference between thermoplastics and thermosetting polymers. The majority of produced polymers, approximately 85%, are thermoplastic. The main reason for this is that the common thermoplastic polymers, such as polyethylene, which is the most common of all, are produced from relatively inexpensive base materials, petroleum and natural gas. In addition, the final product can be produced at low cost in large quantities using injection molding flow molding, and thermal forming processes. As mentioned, the bonds between adjacent long chain molecules in the thermoplastics are about 10 times weaker than bonds between atoms within long chains. These weak bonds, called secondary bonds, determine the overall strength of the polymers. It is hard to break covalent bonds within long molecules, but it is relatively easy to break secondary bonds, separating molecules from each other by applying a mechanical force, pulling apart, or thermal energy, melting. The material will disintegrate, although the long molecules might still be intact. Therefore, thermoplastic polymers are in general less strong and melt at lower temperatures than thermosetting polymers, where bonds in all three directions are relatively equal. Thermoplastic polymers are more ductile and tough compared with thermosetting polymers. One big advantage of thermoplastic polymers is that they can be remelted and recycled, while thermosetting polymers cannot. There are two types of thermoplastic semi-crystalline and amorphous. Crystallinity can strongly affect the properties of a polymer. Okay, so there it is. Thermoplastics can be remelted and reused, whereas thermosetting cannot. The resin inside of a carbon fiber layup, you know, if you're, I mean, even in fiberglass, if you add too much heat to it, you can't, I mean, this probably isn't always the case, but generally speaking, once you've cured a thermoset plastic, it is set, thermoset. So the, uh, the resin that's used in most carbon fiber applications, you, you pull vacuum, pack it all down tight, then you go through either an autoclave or I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but there's always some sort of heat added. And what that heat does is it allows for the chains to form between the resin and allows it to stick to the um, upper and lower layers of carbon fiber. Once it's cured, it cannot be re-cured. There probably are always exceptions to this, but generally what you need to know is the difference between thermosetting plastics and thermoplastic you know, generally, is that thermoplastics can be reheated and reshaped. Thermosettings will disintegrate and char when reheated. Okay, thermosetting polymers. In thermosetting polymers, long chain molecules are cross-linked in a three-dimensional spatial arrangement so that often the whole product becomes one huge molecule. molecule. Cross-linking, also called curing, can be done at, a, at high as well as room temperatures with the help of chemicals. The polymerization, the polym, polymerization, polymerization, linking into long chains, 
of the product generally takes place in two stages. The first, in a chemical plant, where the particles are partially polymerized, but still deformable. And the second, at the part producing facility, where cross-linking is completed under heat and pressure during the shaping of a part. Once the part becomes thermoset, it cannot be remelted or recycled. The difference between recyclability of thermoplastics and thermosets is often compared to freezing water versus making a cake. Thermoplastics can be recycled like the freezing of water and melting of ice, although less often or readily as the polymer will eventually degrade and thermally age. Thermosetting polymers, however, behave like a cake where ingredients, flour, eggs, and butter cannot be recovered from the baked cake. Thermosetting polymers, also called thermosets, exposed to additional heat will burn and char just like a cake left too long in the oven. Okay, I promise we're gonna get into the um, crystalline structures and stuff like that, but we are being guided by the guidebook and uh, it is asking us to continue on to composites right now, which are very, very important, especially because it seems to be the case that in nine out of 10 of NDT folks, we are either doing one or the other, very rarely are we doing both, um, but you will be asked to understand the major advantages and disadvantages and the manufacturing processes and the inspection processes of both. So composites. Composites are a combination of two or more materials where each material can be visually distinguished from the other. As mentioned, alloys also contain more than one element, but the atoms of groups atoms or groups of atoms cannot be distinguished from each other with the naked eye. Composites have improved properties. Hmm. Composites have improved properties than the materials that constitute them, that constitute them. Composites have improved properties than the materials that constitute them. Okay. They can have greater strength, greater toughness, and lighter weight for the same strength. Wood, marble, and granite are natural composites. Engineering composites are formed by coating internal additives and by laminating. Fiberglass is an example of a coated composite. Glass fibers are coated by a polymer to produce a strong and light structure. Support, sporting equipment, such as tennis rackets, made by, may be made of thermosetting polymers reinforced with carbon fibers. The U.S. penny is another example of a coated composite where copper is pressed on zinc. The material cost for producing a copper clad zinc penny is much lower than using pure copper. Honeycomb structures, where an aluminum core or sheet, for example, is sandwiched between layers. This is probably the most common type of engineering composite, honeycomb structures. Where an aluminum core or sheet, for example, is sandwiched between layers of graphite and polymer composites, are lighter than solid aluminum and produce the same strength. Another home honeycomb structure is flame resistant, meta aramid paper and press board. Particle board is a composite of wood chips with epoxy polymer. Plywood is a composite of wooden panels layered in different directions to overcome directional differences in the strength of wood. Um, there are, so aluminum core is possible. It can be uh, honeycomb, so it looks like uh, like like bee, you know, honeycomb that bees make, or it can also be rectangular. Um, so they call that overexpanded sometimes. It can be made of aluminum. It can be made of phenolic, which is uh, another kind of uh, thermoset uh, polymer. Uh, there are basically no limits. I mean, you can use foam core. Uh, there's there's no limits, and there's obviously good engineering reasons to use one or one over another. Um, probably the primary consideration would be strength in a given direction. Yeah, that'd probably be the main thing. Uh, it's, it's always a trade-off between weight and strength. The most common composites used today in engineering consist of high strength, crack sensitive materials, glass, carbon, boron, and others dispersed as particles, continuous fibers, or woven mats immersed in the matrix of thermosetting or thermoplastic polymers. 
Composites with matrix consisting of thermosetic polymers are easier to manufacture. Thermoplastics do not easily wet the fibers to make continuous structures, and they are mostly used in composites with chopped glass fibers. In 2003, only 10% of manufactured composites had thermoplastic matrix. However, attempts have been made to increase this percentage due to the advantages thermoplastics offer in recyclability and less time needed for manufacturing. Properties of composites. Look at that. Well, if you can see the picture, it's pretty cool. What you're actually looking at is a, um, a through transmission unit using two arms. It's a very old style unit. The new ones are a lot better than this, but it looks like it's uh, probably inspecting uh, the nose of an aircraft or something. It looks like it is a fiberglass, maybe Astro Quartz composite. Uh, so the figure 210 says ultrasonic testing of aircraft composite assembly using squirter technique. Uh, this system is sometimes referred to as a gantry. It's a TTU system. And um, yeah, pretty neat little picture. Properties of composites. Properties of composites are greatly influenced by the type of, type of matrix and the type, shape, and size of reinforcement materials used. Here we are going to give a very brief general comparison between composites and other materials used in engineering applications. A more detailed discussion will be left for later. Compared with other engineering materials, engineering composites in general have the following characteristics. Composites are stronger than unreinforced matrices. High performance polymers with a thermosetting matrix can have a specific strength. Remember that? That is strength per unit weight, higher than material, higher than metals. Composites with thermoplastic matrix are not so strong, but they are stronger than unreinforced plastics. Composites are corrosion resistant. Composites used in everyday applications are often less expensive than the materials they replace. For example, concrete is more often used, cheaper and tougher than tiles or stone for paving roads. New manufacturing methods have had to be developed to manufacture composites and special care has to be exercised to keep tolerances. Applications of composites. Now, um, this is in an ever expanding list because people are constantly trying to make new composites uh, or new composite applications rather. So uh, right now, new space is a very uh, big and expanding industry. There are companies like Relativity Space that are trying to 3D print an entire rocket. And then there are companies like Firefly who have su successfully made an entire rocket out of composite. So um, this list will never stop expanding. Uh, eventually, we will probably have more um, composite cars. Obviously, carbon fiber has been a nice feature on cars. Although ironically, and many times carbon fiber used for cars is purely to look cool. It doesn't always weigh less than the uh, alloys that you could use um, for a lot of reasons. But anyway, applications of composites. Composites find applications in fiberglass boats, airplanes, and satellites. For example, stealth planes are made from composites with special coatings or skins made with radar absorbent materials, rams, tennis rackets, golf clubs, and bicycle, as well as bicycle helmets and hard hats are made mainly of composites. Melamine cafeteria trays, as well as formica countertops are made from composites. However, the largest quanti quantity of composites is still used in construction as concrete. Non-destructive testing of composites is shown in figure 210. That was this back here where you see an, an ultrasonic squirter system. Pretty cool system, typically does TTU. It's obviously capable of pulse echo as well. Um, just depends on your configuration. Uh, the pulse echo data is not always great because there's a lot of turbulence on the receiving channel. If you're just using one transducer and you're using a water column as a delay, you can imagine that that's going to be a very noisy signal. So um, 
I don't really feel a strong need to go into biomaterials, but I'll just read the overview. Biomaterials can be implanted in the human body without causing adverse biological reaction or rejection. They are used to replace damaged or diseased body parts. Several materials from each group mentioned above can be used for biomaterials. And every day, new materials are developed and adapted for use in the human body. Among metals, titanium is often used, is used most often for hip replacement and other bone replacement. Whereas ceramics are very suitable for bone replacement due to their strength, hardness, and inertness. Skipping ahead. Skipping ahead. Okay. This is another important part. Um, RT guys tend to talk a lot more about atoms because atomic structure is, well, it's not necessarily important in what they do day to day, but it's important uh, in the training more so than many other methods. So for some of you, this will just be review, but for many other people, this will be the first time that you're hearing anything about atoms since 11th grade chemistry. So uh, atomic structure, as it was described in previous, as it was described in previous section, in the previous, in a previous, anyway, so I know that I'm not always so clear and easy to follow, but I promise you this book is loaded with typos. As it was described in previous sections, I guess, different materials can exhibit a wide range of properties and many of them can be related to the type of atoms and arrangement of atoms in the structure. By definition, an atom is the smallest part of an element that retains the properties of that element. A molecule is the smallest part of the compound which is a substance consisting of more than one kind of atom that retains properties of that compound. The science that governs the system of atomic and subatomic particles and their behavior in atoms and solids is called quantum mechanics. A detailed explanation of quantum mechanics is beyond the scope of this book and probably many of the people who wrote this book. And we will give only a simplified explanation of principles involved. Each atom consists of a nucleus composed of protons, pos positively charged particles. <laughs> I do like that it puts in there that's an arbitrary convention um, because interestingly enough, and this is very parenthetical, it's not necessarily important information, but it is interesting. The reason why they say that positively charged particles is an arbitrary convention is because the polarity is something that it's not really I promise you it's true. It's interesting, but the polarity is not important. It's not important which is positive and which is negative necessarily. It's important that they oppose each other. So we describe and have described for forever protons being positively charged and electrons being negatively charged. Um, and then neutrons of having no charge, but it's not important which is negative or positive. It's important the way they behave and it's important that they're polar, meaning that they have opposing charges. Interesting, um, really cool that they put that in there. Uh, but again, beyond the scope of the book, but just a little tidbit to know um, it's trivial and I, I like the trivia. But positively charged particles, those are called protons and that's what it'll be called on the test and anytime you see it. So that's what's in the nucleus. You've got protons and neutrons, which are not electrically charged. So you could say that the nucleus overall has a positive charge because it is made of protons and neutrons. Remember again, that the number of protons in the nucleus, the Z number is the, num is the atomic number, right? So the number of protons in the nucleus is what gives the element its structure, essentially. Okay. The nucleus is relatively stationary and very small. It's about 10 to the negative 14 meters. It is encircled by a thinly dispersed moving electron cloud of varying density so that the diameter of the atom is on the order of 10 to the negative 10 meters. 
about 10,000 larger, 10,000 times larger than the nucleus. Both protons and electrons have equal magnitude of electrical charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative C, and electrons have an equal magnitude of electrical charge. I'm sorry. Uh, and so both protons and electrons have an equal magnitude of electrical charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 C, which is coulombs, but the charge of electrons is considered negative, while the protons is positive. Yeah, see, they're being very careful with their language here, which is really neat. Um, also, it used to be believed that um, electron, electrons formed rings surrounding the nucleus, uh, but it is now pretty much a standard convention that electrons don't really exist in rings or shells, that they are a cloud that is orbiting the nucleus. It's, um, again, very trivial, but... I'm glad that this book made the distinction because it seems to be the case that that is a more accurate representation of the way atoms are formed. So the classic picture of the atom that we've seen in all of our school books where you have these different shells, um, that is not actually the case, but it works for physics uh, as an example or a model because as we'll go on to continue or to talk about, you'll see that um, electrons constantly drop in energy and increase in energy. And that's really where a lot of the fun stuff happens. That's where we get light and all radioactivity comes from electrons coming closer to the nucleus and going further away from the nucleus. And they refer to that movement as lowering in energy shells, mostly. So, Due to the very small size of atoms, once or only since the mid 1990s has it been possible to see atoms with available microscopes. With optical microscopes, also called inverted microscopes, scientists are able to distinguish different microstructures, grains and grain boundaries. The human eye can distinguish down to 10 to the negative four of a meter or one tenth of a millimeter. Optical microscopes can resolve features of 10 to the negative seven meters or 1,000 times smaller than the human eye can see. Recently developed microscopes can distinguish features on the order of nanometers, with, uh, that's 10 to, the 10 to the negative nine, where one meter is mentioned equals yeah, 10 to the negative nine of meters. Currently available microscopes with very high resolutions include scanning electron microscopes. They'll probably ask you about that on the test. Scanning electron, mi uh, scanning electron microscopes have a one nanometer resolution. Transmission electron microscopes, TEM, are less than one nanometer. They are a tenth of a nanometer or 0.1 nanometer. Atomic force microscopes, same as the, um, same as the transmission electron microscopes, are uh, down to one tenth of a nanometer or 0.1 nanometer resolution. Scanning tunneling microscopes, STM. They have one hundredth of a nanometer or ten thousandths of a nanometer depth and one tenth of a nanometer or 0.1 nanometer lateral resolution. Lateral side to side depth obviously is uh, a projection. These sophisticated microscopes are bringing humans into the range of seeing individual atoms, although the processes that they use do not create images using light as with optical microscopes. Although specific scanning probe microscopes differ from one another with regard to the type of interaction that is monitored, these instruments have provided a wealth of information about a variety of materials, from integrated circuit chips to bi biological molecules, and have helped us move into the era of nanomaterials and engineered atomic and molecular structures. Moving on, now we're talking about the thing that we all dreaded in high school, the periodic table of elements. It's a very useful tool if you want to appear smart. Atomic number. The atomic number referred to as the Z number is the number of protons in the nucleus. For a neutral atom that is completely without missing electrons, important, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. Important. This atomic number ranges in integers from one for hydrogen to 92 for uranium. 
the highest of naturally occurring elements. It is given in the top of each square in the periodic table of elements as shown in figure 2.14. All right. I'm not sure if you can hear my wonderful fiance in uh, the living room now, but um, she is now talking. So here we are. Moving on, atomic mass. Masses of atomic particles are very small. Protons and neutrons have approximately the same mass. 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. While the mass of an electron is equal to 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, or approximately 1 1836th of the mass of a proton. The total mass of the atom is found when the masses of protons and neutrons are added together while the masses of electrons are mostly neglected. So in short, the atomic mass is the combination of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. Electrons are mostly ignored. The Z number is the number of protons in the nucleus. The Z number is also the atomic number. Z number, atomic number. That's where it's located on the periodic table. Uranium, 92. That means there are 92 protons in the nucleus. The atomic mass of uranium is different. That's the number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. Got it. <clears throat> While neutral atoms have an equal number of protons and electrons, that is the reason they are neutral, since the positive charge and negative charges cancel each other out. The number of neutrons can vary, causing the atomic mass to vary. The atomic are the atoms of the same element that have different number of neutrons in their nucleus and therefore is different atomic mass called isotopes. That's how you get radiation when you have two types of the same element but they have different number of neutrons in the nucleus, you tend to create instability. Boom. For simplicity, a new unit of mass was, introdu was introduced, the atomic mass unit. The AMU is equal to 1 12th of the atomic mass of carbon-12, the most common isotope of carbon. Carbon-12 contains six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Therefore, the atomic mass unit is approximately 1.67 times 10 to the negative 24 grams, or 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Conversely, one gram is equal to 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd AMU, the mass of every atom in the periodic table of elements expressed in the AMU unit is given at the bottom of each square below the chemical symbol for the element. For example, iron has an atomic mass of 55 0.85 AMU, that is one atom of iron has approximately 55.85.16 times 10 to the negative 24 grams, which equals 93.264 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. Trivially, one gram is the weight of one chickpea, which is really weird, but that's what it is. You can look it up. Also known as a gar garbanzo bean. Another way of specifying the mass of an element is specifying the mass per one mole of atoms. Moles, uh, this is, yeah, 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd power, so-called Avogadro's number of atoms and molecules. For instance, one mole of iron atoms or Avogadro's number of atoms has a mass of 55.845 grams. This can be attained by multiplying one iron atom like, I'm just going to skip this because I know it's not. You just need to know, maybe you might need to know that a mole is Avogadro's number and that Avogadro's number or a mole equals the value of 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. Um, atomic weight is different than mass. Um, as all weight is different than mass to a degree. Instead of mass, material scientists often use the term atomic weight, where weight is mass multiplied by gravitation. It is what you read when you put something on the scale. 
It can be a, it can be represented in grams or kilograms, for example, often used terms in material science for iron are as follows. Atomic weight of iron, 55.845, and molecular weight, or weight of one mole of iron is 54.845 grams. Note, in engineering, the unit for weight or force is one newton, which is approximately one-tenth of one kilogram. Atomic bonding, excuse me. Atoms are assumed to be spherical, although this assumption is not always justified. Electrons exist around the nucleus in orbits with different radii, each representing a different energy level. Only two electrons, which must have different spins, can have the same energy level. This is the so-called Pauli exclusion principle. Some different energy levels are combined into shells. The electrons that occupy the outermost shell are called valence electrons. And these electrons are extremely important as they participate in the bonding between atoms to form atomic molecular groups. Furthermore, many of the physical and chemical properties of solids are based on these valence electrons. Some atoms have stable electron configurations. That is, their valence electrons are completely filled. These atoms are, these elements are, these are the noble gases. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. They are inert. The reason why they're inert is because they have a full valence shell of electrons. It's important. Um, inert, meaning non-reactive, by the way. So they are inert or noble gases, which virtually do not react chemically with other elements. Some atoms of the elements that have unfilled valence shells assume the stable electron configuration by gaining or losing electrons or sharing, uh, by sharing electrons with other atoms. Atoms that have an electrical charge are called ions. If it has a charge at all, then it is an ion, positive or negative. If it is positively charged, it is called cation. And if it is negatively charged, it's called anion. So think cathode to anode, cathode being the positively charged and anode being the negative charged. Cathode ray tube, um, inside of an X-ray tube, you have uh, a cathode going to the anode target. Um, cations have smaller atomic radii than neutral atom, atoms, while anions have larger radii. Metals are called electropositive elements because they easily give up their valence electrons and become positively charged. Most elements in the periodic table are metals. Elements located on the right side of the periodic table are electronegative, meaning they readily accept electrons and form anions, chemical bonding between atoms. The scientific principle that is that every object seeks to decrease its potential energy. Chemical bonding between atoms is accompanied by a net decrease in the potential energy of atoms in the bonded state. For our purpose, it is important to discuss different types of bonding between atoms and their influence and properties of materials. In general, chemical bonding between atoms can be divided into two groups, primary or strong bonds, secondary or weak bonds. Three different types of primary bonds are found in solids, ionic, covalent, and metallic. Strong bonds mean that large amounts of energy have to be spent to separate atoms. These energy, this energy can be mechanical, work done to break the part, or thermal energy necessary to melt the part. Therefore, stiffness of the part and melting temperature are indications of the strength of the bonds. Ionic materials have melting and boiling points, have high melting and boiling points due to a strong ionic bond. Ionic bonds are one where the atom is basically, or the electrons are basically stolen Whereas covalent, covalent, the electrons are sharing shells. Just an interesting thing. However, if the strong bonds are present only between certain sets of atoms, as with covalent bonds, 
Materials can easily be broken or melted into molecules at low temperature without separating strong primary bonds in each molecule. It is important to understand these key aspects of atomic bonds in order to predict how measurable properties might change due to differences in chemistry and temperature. Figure 2.15 <clears throat> shows how the energy of two atoms interacting with each other changes depending on how close they are to each other. The steep wall near the y-axis indicates that two atoms cannot be easily pushed into each other so that the, they occupy the same space. This can be done, of course, and it is known as nuclear fusion. As the two atoms get farther apart, they interact less. There is a trough in the curve, which is the equilibrium bonding distance at zero degrees Kelvin, or absolute zero, which is a theoretical number. Atomic responses to increase in temperature. When atoms increase in temperature, they gain kinetic energy and vibrate. Temperature is essentially a measurement of kinetic energy of atoms. Because the bonding curve is not symmetrical, an atom vibrates more and more. An atom that vibrates more and more will be, on average, slightly further away from the minimum of the bonding curve. This is the cause of thermal expansion, which is why most materials, most materials, with the exception of polymers, expand when heated. Some exceptions exist during phase transformation, such as ice melting as well. This causes a change in material stiffness. The stiffness of the material is directly related to the shape of the bonding curve. So this is funny. So ice is one of the few molecules, or water rather, is one of the few molecules that because of the shape of the molecule, stacks on top of each other when freezing. Most other molecules, when you cool them enough that they get to a freezing point, they condense and shrink. But for whatever reason, the shape of the water molecule, when it freezes, expands, which is why ice floats. And interestingly enough, if ice didn't float, we life on Earth might not exist. I can't explain that, but I heard a smart person say it one time, so I like repeating it because it makes me sound smart. So, um, bu, 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 bu. the stiffness of a material is directly related to the shape of the bonding curve. As the material heats up, the atoms move farther apart. They will also be at a position on the curve with less sharp curvature. That means the elastic modulus will decrease as temperature increases. If the stiffness of a material decreases, the speed of sound or shear modulus in that material also decreases. Acoustic velocity, as measured with ultrasonic testing, for instance, is governed by material density. Thus, the stiffness of a material and correspondingly the speed of sound in that material are related to the strength of the atomic bonds. The strength of those bonds is dependent on which atoms are present and how they are arranged relative to each other. For this reason, most steels will have very similar stiffness. In other words, steels almost all have elastic modulus between 195 GPA and 210 GPA. Aluminum alloys will have elastic moduli around 70 GPA. This is very useful information in practice because you can make a very accurate guess about the stiffness of a material and therefore the speed of sound if you know the stiffness of a similar chemistry. Knowing that the stiffness changes with chemistry and temperature can be very useful when analyzing results of ultrasonic testing. Okay, I think we're gonna stop here in this video and then we're gonna resume with ionic bonding, covalent bonding, metallic bonding, and then finally crystalline structure with the next video. So we can consider that an introduction into atomic structure, um, ceramics, plastics, and um, yeah, good stuff. Okay. Um, See you next time. Thanks for checking it out.